An agency's mission statement encapsulates, in a few words, what the agency is all about. So when you see a mission statement, the words that use prevent, prepare, protect, educate, and partnerships with a focus on saving lives, it would be logical to assume that you were reading the mission statement of a public health agency. And you would be right. But you may be surprised to know that these words are not from the mission statement of the Department of Health, but from the Department of Public Safety one of the many agencies of state government focused on protecting and improving the health of all Minnesotans. On today's episode of A Public Health Journal, we're going to talk about the Minnesota Department of Public Safety and the role it plays in keeping Minnesotans safe and healthy. Please stay tuned. Welcome to A Public Health Journal, a program that explores public health issues facing our society today and tomorrow. The host of the show is Dr. Ed Ellinger, Commissioner of Health for the State of Minnesota. A Public Health Journal is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and the Hennepin County Human Services and Public Health Department, all working together towards the goal of healthy people living in healthy communities. Welcome to A Public Health Journal. Today we're going to focus on the activities of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. When most people think of the Department of Public Safety, they think about driver's licenses, state patrol, and law enforcement but that's only a part of what the agency does to fulfill its overall mission to protect people from all sorts of calamities, save lives, and improve the quality of life in Minnesota. To me, as health commissioner, this means that the Department of Public Safety is an important and vital public health partner. Joining me to talk about the roles and activities of the Department of Public Safety is Mona Doman, commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Before being appointed commissioner in 2011, Commissioner Doman was chief of the Maple Grove Police Department. Mona, welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I was talking about, uh, you know, the, the mission statement that you have, and you really do have a broad mission. It's not just you know, arrest people and give them uh, tickets for uh, uh, speeding on the highway. Uh, when you came in as the chief of police, for the state as Department of Public Health. Did you recognize the, the broad array of activities that the department had? Well, it didn't take me very long to realize that I had a huge umbrella um, with you know, over 2,000 employees working in the Department of Public Safety in 15 different divisions. And most people think when they talk about the Department of Public Safety, they think of the sworn officer sort of arms of the department, but yes, we have um, Office of Pipeline Safety, we have Homeland Security and Emergency Management, we have the Driver and Vehicle Services, which is about 500 employees mm. who, um, who touch millions of people every single uh, year in getting driver's licenses and vehicle registrations and things like that. So we have a very, very broad, diverse and complex agency. Right. In fact, I've got a slide here that we're going to put on the screen that does show the various components of the department. And maybe you could just kind of walk through some of those things that, that people might be surprised at seeing. Uh, you know, certainly the safety you know, patrol and traffic safety driver service. But, you know, what about pipeline safety? How does that fit into what you're doing? Well, you, as, as you look at the slide, you, as I talked about, you can see the um, the high visibility sort of arms of the division, and that is the Minnesota State Patrol. We see the maroon squad cars and, and troopers out on our roads and highways every day of the year. Um, the Office of Traffic Safety, though, is the sort of the work behind the scenes of traffic safety mm. in the state of Minnesota. So we have employees who are continually working on and studying um, road fatalities and crashes and the dangerous um, pieces of traveling on our roads and highways. Yeah, and we'll be talking about that in the second part of our we show. Will. We're talking about towards zero deaths, one of the big issues that you're working on. Yes, that we're working together on, actually. Yeah. In the Office of Pipeline Safety, most people don't really think about the fact that we have many, many miles of pipeline going through our state, and we are responsible for any, um, for investigating explosions that mm. occur um, in the pipelines along throughout the state of Minnesota, if and when they happen. Um, and then we have um, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, where we have sort of three arms in the Bureau, training, um, investigation, and then the um, Forensic Science Division mm -hmm. there. And those people really do sort of work behind the scenes, except for maybe about 60 agents who assist other agencies throughout the state of Minnesota in um, major investigations like homicides and, and critical incidents and those sorts of things. And then we have the Fire Marshals Division, um, where we work with all of the different fire service um, entities across the state of Minnesota, about 784 fire departments, and then probably seven, I believe it's seven different fire associations, the State Fire Chiefs mm. Association, the Firefighters Association, and so we are sort of, um, throughout the Department of Public Safety, sort of the backbone of resources for um, 
all entities across the state who uh, work in the public safety arena. Mm. And how about that, the homeland security kind of things? This is another, again, national kind of focus, but you take the, sort of the local response or the state response for that? Right, our Homeland Security and Emergency Manage di Management Div Division actually has two sort of roles. We have the Homeland Security uh, role and then we have the Emergency Management role. And our director of HSEM is Chris Eide and she is also the Governor's Homeland Security Advisor. So she works with people in Washington to, to learn about the role of um, Minnesota in overall Homeland Security across the nation and certainly then in our state. And then emergency management, anytime you st we talk about a disaster, whether it was the floods in Duluth and the Northeast region um, last year, whether it was the tornado that came through Minneapolis the first year we were in office with Governor Dayton, and then we had the, the storm down in southwestern Minnesota, um, our people in the uh, HSA, HSEM division work with the locals to uh, provide resources as they respond and recover from those mm -hmm critical in, or yeah. those um, disasters. Right. And one of the other areas, you know, certainly, you know, the Department of Human Services and the Department of Health deal with alcohol. Uh, what, what's your role in, in alcohol and gambling and those kinds of things? Well, we have an alcohol and gambling enforcement division and our role is to um, investigate and to, um, well, first of all, we permit um, alcohol um, sales in, in mm. the state. So, um, so you provide the licenses. We provide the licenses. And, um, and then we provide investigations to make sure that those that are, um, have gambling um, pull tabs and things like that in their facilities, that they're uh, doing it appropriately and by the law. Yeah. And certainly as I went through your, your mission statement and you know, all the things, you know, prevent and prepare and respond, uh, it said maintain public trust and develop strong partnerships. Mm -hmm. It sounds like those partnerships are pretty important that, you know, with federal and local uh, and other agencies. Tell us a little bit about that, that partnership role that you played. I think that the Department of Public Safety cannot exist if we don't work first to create really strong and solid relationships with all of our public safety partners around the state of Minnesota. It is probably one of the primary things that I do on a daily basis is reaching out to our stakeholders and constituents in the various various um, aspects of public safety to make sure that we are in constant communication, that we're listening to what the needs are so that we can better direct our resources. Okay, good. Well, I want to talk about a couple of the specific programs that you have, particularly the Towards Zero Deaths that we've been working on collaboratively. But first, we need to take a little break. We'll be back right after this message. Oh, everything's right in here. He just got his license. Is he here? Yeah, he's upstairs in his room. So just to review, no more than one friend in the car at any time. No cell phone use. Right, right. right. Seat belts, of course. No alcohol. Yeah. Jason, this is our attorney. Find a way, any way, to lay down teen driving rules for your kids. For more ideas, visit us online. Welcome back. We're talking about the roles and responsibilities of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety with the commissioner of that department, Mona Doman. Uh, Mona, in the last segment, we were talking about partnerships and certainly I mean, I'm thinking about uh, some of the things that you do, like the, the alcohol stuff. You know, we have a federal agency, alcohol, tobacco and firearms, and, and now you have the local level in those kinds of partnerships. What's your role relative to federal agencies in all of the things that you do? What are some of the, the agencies that you have to deal with on a regular basis at the federal level? Well, one of the, our Office of Traffic Safety deals um, on a daily basis with the National Highway Transfer, Transportation Safety Administration, or NHTSA, as some might um, recognize it. And we, are, we get, the state gets federal funds to help us work on reducing, in one of our areas, in reducing fatal um, 
fatal crashes and serious injury crashes around the state of Minnesota. Okay, so let's let's talk about that. And as we here in, in this state, you know, we have a partnership. You talked about partnerships, and certainly we've been working with you over the years on on reducing traffic fatalities in this thing called TZD or towards zero deaths. And we've got a, a slide on uh, that we're going to put on that that actually shows what's happened to fatalities over the the last uh, several years. Uh, or last decade, and uh, talk through you know, what the, the data show and then what are we doing collaboratively? What's the partnership and, and particularly the public safety's role in that? Well, the initiative actually started in 2003, the Towards Zero Deaths program, and it is a partnership, a collaborative effort between the Department of Health, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Public Safety. And the main focus is to reduce serious traffic crashes and, and uh, fatalities across the state of Minnesota. And it looks like you're doing a pretty good job and, given the, looking at, at this slide. And we have, in the last decade, we've reduced um, traffic fatalities by 44%, which is really significant. Um, we have seen, though, last year and um, this year an uptick in the fatalities, uh, speci specifically the fatalities. And so we do have a little bit of concern, and so there's certainly more work to be done between our agencies and the people that work with us. Mm -hmm. So, so what is the, how mm -hmm. does the collaboration between transportation and health change how you look at your role in that uh, regard? Well, you know, I was a police officer for 30 years before coming to the state, and I remember being part of the enforcement teams of um, trying to change driver behavior around the state of Minnesota. And then I came to the Department of Public Safety and realized um, this TZD partnership and the fact that um, it's not just about enforcement, it's about education, it's about emergency medical services, how fast we get responders to the scene to save lives. And it's about engineering, how we build our roads and, and the things that we provide on our roads to keep vehicles from rolling, keep vehicles on the roadways and such. And so um, that and then along with um, the education piece that we work very hard on in the Office of Traffic Safety mm -hmm. at DPS. So, so what do you do with, what are some of the initiatives that you have? I know I see the, the click it and ticket mm -hmm. and certainly lots of things related to alcohol consumption. What are, what are the approaches that you take in educating the population about vehicle safety, traffic safety? So we just ended um, a click it or ticket campaign where we have over 400 agencies across the state of Minnesota partnering with the Minnesota State Patrol or partnering with the Department of Public Safety on enforcing um, seatbelt use um, across the state of Minnesota. Our goal really isn't necessary, necessarily to write tickets for uh, lack of seatbelt use. It really is to educate folks who are driving on our roadways about the importance and the significance of wearing a seatbelt when you're driving or riding in a vehicle on our state roads and highways in mm -hmm. Minnesota. Mm -hmm. what, what are the, the major reasons for uh, fatal crashes? What, what's behind it? Is it distracted driving? Is it alcohol? Uh, you know, is it speed? You know, or is it all of those a little bit? Uh... We say it's four, there are four different reasons that are, are um, specific to crashes and fatalities, and that is speed is number one. Um, we hope that people would drive sober because uh, impaired driving is, is in the mix, lack of seat belt use, and then just inattentive or distracted driving. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a, a big increase in distracted driving you know, with all of the, the screens that, that people have? We are, actually, and, and we are also seeing a big increase in motorcycle accidents. And so we, we believe we've been studying, looking at the numbers, and we believe that we have a lot of people um, buying motorcycles that are less experienced in driving motorcycles. And we've had some extended summers, um, you know, earlier springs and later falls and winters, and so we've had more time to ride motorcycles on our roads and highways. And so we're seeing an uptick in um, in road deaths uh, related to motorcycle riding yeah. as well. And also, I know the demographics are changing. Like young folks are are taking longer to get their driver's license. It's not you know when you reach 16, it's not the big pressure to get it. And a lot of baby boomers are are getting motorcycles, trying to have a second uh, second youth. So you must be seeing some of the changes and and sort of who is involved in, in crashes over the years. We are. You know, when when you have a young um, motorist who hasn't had a lot of experience driving and then they get a driver's license and then you put a phone in their hand and they start texting and, and driving or answering a phone call. 
um, certainly that is um, something that we're concerned about as we go about and, and as our troopers um, visit with motorists on their highways. Mm -hmm. And I know the, the <coughs> national data, as I look at it, these graduated driver's licenses have had a huge impact on, on reducing fatalities among young folks. Are you seeing the same thing here in Minnesota? We are. It is all about experience in driving, whether it's you know the road conditions, the weather conditions, um, non-impaired driving and um, in, in attentive driving versus not. Mm -hmm. And then certainly seatbelt use. There's always uh, the, the question about whether or not wearing a seatbelt is, is a safe thing to do. And what we realize is that if you roll your car, there's a chance you're gonna be ejected if you don't have a seatbelt on. And if you wear a seatbelt, um, or if you don't wear a seat belt, you may be a safe driver, but you don't know about the people driving around you on the roads. So there's still some pushback about the, the effectiveness of seat belts? People tend to sometimes hold up that one case that somebody lived through a crash that uh, was not wearing a seat belt. But if you talk to troopers who are at fatal crashes and, and traffic accident scenes, I can tell you that they would tell you um, that one case may be one of very few that you need to be wearing your seat belt, right. belt and everybody in the car needs to wear right. their seat belt. Well certainly another one that, that we worked on collaboratively is, is alcohol use because alcohol is a huge issue in, in traffic fatalities but has that been changing over the years because I know enforcement has really increased over the last you know 15 20 years on alcohol you seeing that a decreasing amount or is it still one of those high uh, fatality issues? Actually we're seeing the alcohol um, impact decreasing. Um, you know, speed is still the number one reason for traffic crashes. Alcohol used to be up quite a bit higher. Um, but there's more work to be done because we really need to um, we really need to educate the public to not get behind the wheel if they've had anything to drink or any other um, substance that might impair their driving. Yeah. Did you see the lowering the blood alcohol content uh, for drunk driving having an impact on, on you know, the number of people driving impaired? You know, I haven't really seen the statistics on that, but I can imagine that it, it um, wakes people up. It makes people think twice about um, having a couple of drinks with dinner or, you know, doing, hooking up with folks at a happy hour and then getting behind the car, uh, behind the wheel of their car. Yeah, good. Well, I want to talk about a few other issues, but we need to take another little break. We'll be back right after this message. Are you watching how fast you're going? I, I didn't know I was speeding. I was going down a hill. Speeding? I didn't see the sign. I don't think so. But nobody else is on the road. My foot fell asleep. I gotta pick up my kids at daycare. Is it because I'm driving a red car? I didn't see you. My wife's going into labor, sir. I I didn't know. I was looking at a different gauge. I'm not really from around here. Something must be wrong with the speedometer. Trust us, we've heard it all. Now hear this. Extra speed enforcement is on Minnesota roads. There's no excuse for speeding. But I always go this fast. If you have a collision at 25 miles an hour, and you're not wearing a seatbelt, it's like falling from a two-story building. At 40 miles an hour, it's like falling from six stories high. And at 60 miles an hour, if you're not wearing your seatbelt and you crash, it's like falling from 12 stories high. Buckle up. A message from the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Welcome back. We're talking with Mona Doman, Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety uh, for the state of Minnesota. Uh, Mona, it's, are you the, the first female uh, director of the uh, Department of Public Safety? I actually am, mm -hmm. although I didn't know that when I accepted the, the job. I had not paid attention to that Because yeah, that tra traditionally has been a, a male role. How did you get into public safety in that, the whole field? Well, I grew up in southwestern Minnesota, and my grandfather was the police chief in the small town that I that I grew up in and I remember watching him throughout my very young years and the impact that he had on people in our little town and the fact that he knew so many people and that he cared for so many people and um, I decided that uh, I wanted to try and have the same sort of impact mm. uh, somewhere and in some role um, as he was having in our community and so I decided to go into law enforcement. Yes. So, so what kind of professional training have you had? What's, what's the role that, that people can take to become the, the commissioner of the Department of Public Safety or the police chief of Maple Grove? Well, I can tell you I didn't have the, the goal of the Department <laughs> of Public Safety commissioner on my list, but, but um, 
I wanted to be a police officer really bad and really fast, and I, st I took the fastest route, and that was I went to Alexandria Technical College and got my two-year Associate of Arts degree in law enforcement and got hired right out of school. And then while I was working, I went back and got my undergraduate degree from Metro State, um, Metropolitan State University, and I worked that my degree was in criminal justice administration. I knew that I wanted to have an influence in the administrative sort of work of a police department, and that was um, what I was working towards. And then I was fortunate. I was nominated to go to the FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and I spent three months training in 1998 out at the uh, FBI Academy and came back and realized that uh, I really did want to work um, as a, really my goal was to be the police chief in, in Maple Grove, hoping that I would someday have that opportunity. And so I went back to the University of St. Thomas and got my master's degree in police leadership administration mm. and education. And, um, and the timing was right and I was prepared and was offered the job in 1991, or in 2001, excuse me, for, um, to be, serve as the police chief in Maple Grove. Yeah. So, you know, leadership is always important in agencies, and, and, and what, what sort of values or philosophy or vision are you bringing to the Department of Public Safety to, you know, to shape what it's going to accomplish during the, your tenure as, as director, as commissioner? You know, I mentioned earlier that we really, the Department of Public Safety really is the backbone for resources. Um, and, and my hope is that when I leave office um, that I will have established for public safety entities across the state of Minnesota when they're in need of, of help or resources that their first thought is to call the Department of Public Safety and that we will be able to somehow direct them to the resources or provide the resources that need, they need to get them through the um, situation that they're involved in. My values really are about um, excelling and being the very best that we can be in everything that we do. And um, my cornerstone or my three expectations that I have for all of the employees at the, state, at the Department of Public Safety, including myself, is to, uh, be, to work hard. Um, we, I believe that the citizens of the state of Minnesota deserve uh, eight hours of pay for, or eight hours of work for eight hours of pay uh, and the like to be the very best that we can be at what we do, um, to be honest um, and transparent. I think that we, the citizens, also deserve honesty and transparency from the work that we do the, and the services that we provide. And then the good old golden rule that we should, and that's about customer service, that we, sh we should treat every interaction that we have with a citizen in the state of Minnesota uh, as we would want to be treated. And so that, we, we do our work around those three mm -hmm. principles. Yeah, and in, and in the whole scheme of things, you're all from you know, education and prevention to enforcement and, you know, and you know, wrap up after that. You know, are you, you, do you try to balance resources to, to have the biggest impact uh, to prevent or in the enforcement as sort of a, a fallback when prevention works? What, what kind of approach do you take in, in, in all of your areas in that regard? Most of our work really is about education and prevention. And then there are just some times where people, um, there, there are people who just don't either have, the, have access to the prevention or an, an education um, pieces of what we do. And there are some people who just don't appreciate um, that. And so the enforcement piece comes into play. But certainly most uh, and the bulk of our work is on prevention and education prior to any other mm -hmm. sort of um, arm of yeah. Our work. And we, we talked a little bit about, about the partnerships. Tell me a little bit about the partnerships you have with local law enforcement. I and mean, we have, you know, counties and cities and townships throughout the state. How do you work with those and how do you support that kind of law enforcement? Well, you know, first of all, our state troopers are on the roads and highways and they are interacting with local law enforcement every single day of um, the year. We respond to crashes together. We respond to incidents on our roads and highways together. Our Bureau of Criminal App Apprehension um, as of last night and this morning, they're down in Shakopee helping with a, a investigation, a major investigation. And so the work, we don't exist really without local partners. We are there to provide any resources that they might need. And so um, we, we are there when they call for us. Mm -hmm. And it is a daily, uh, it's on a daily basis in every single one of the divisions that we have in the Department of Now Public you don't State. have any control over there. It's a true partnership. You don't you know, direct what they do. Correct. Correct. Um, there, there are questions. I get questions every once in a while about 
how do I possibly control, you know, for 350 police departments and 87 sheriff's <laughs> offices around the state of Minnesota? And I'm always very clear to, to make sure that people know that there is a police chief in every police department in Minnesota and there's a sheriff in every county in the state of Minnesota. And they are the boss of that agency, and we really just are the resource that they might need. Yeah, good. Well, it's been nice being a partner with you on a whole variety of public health issues from alcohol and traffic safety and, and drug abuse. Uh, it's been a great partnership, so, so thanks for being there. Likewise, thank you very much for good. having me. And I'm gonna be back with a closing comment right after this message. Stay for a ride. I mean, I gotta go. Traffic's a little heavy, though. I wonder if this person in front of me sees me. I listen to the song. I'm sure they see me. Should I be for dinner? It looks clear. Let's get in front of this bus mm. here. Maybe I should pick up Chinese. I don't feel like cooking tonight. Okay, everything looks good. There's something going on over there. Mm. They really gotta see me in that mirror. Oh, I better get on the other side hey, of the road. Hey, hey, look! Look, look, out, look, out. look twice for motorcyclists. Still texting. Is this a real morgue? Yep. Shut up. Like with real dead people. Ooh, I gotta text Ashley. Ashley identified you when you wrapped your car around that light pole because she was caring more about that thing than the road. I knew she liked me. Not anymore. There's a reason it's illegal to text and access the web while driving. <laughs> Although we have the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and state and local health departments who are charged with providing a variety of public health services, the health of the public is not just their responsibility. Public health is the responsibility of all of us. Public health is not just a place of employment, it is more of a philosophy of life or an approach to making our communities better. So if you're concerned about the overall health of your community, if you think health is both an individual and a societal responsibility, if you think being well means more than just being physically healthy, if you'd rather prevent a problem than treat it, and if you see yourself as part of a team responsible for keeping people safe and healthy, then you are a public health worker. And as we heard today, the staff of the Department of Public Safety certainly fit the definition, definition of public health workers and are a part of the public health team. So no matter where you work, you can also advance the health of the public by promoting programs and activities that protect and improve the overall health of the people in your community. And all of us need to be public health workers because, as the Institute of Medicine said, public health is what we, as a society, do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. People working together can do a lot more than individuals working alone, and the efforts of all of us are necessary to create a healthy future for our state, country, and the world. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you can join us again next time on a Public Health Journal.